All right, looks like we are live now. So we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, again. This is our 11th, 11th Black Males Mental Health and Wellbeing Support Group. Um, we really are excited to continue to bring these uh, to the community because we do feel, um, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Thomas, we feel that <clears throat> having these ongoing really keeps the community updated on, you know, the, the latest occurrences. And the most recent is, <clears throat> excuse me, having the uh, county executive, uh, Joe, Joe Parisi on with us because we wanted to give him an opportunity to speak to a little bit to the declaration that's been extended. Um, and so we'll be a little out of order um, today, but we'll come circle back to, to introductions with everyone. And so we also have Damon Boatwright. He's the regional president of SSM Health. Um, he is going to give an overview from the health system lens um, as we talk about COVID-19 and where we're at. Um, so let's go ahead and get started because I know that the county kind of executive and, and Damon uh, Boatwright, uh, we want to be sensitive to their schedule. So Mr. County Executive, you want to go ahead and give us an overview on what's happening? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks very much for doing this. It's good to see you all again. So as you hopefully know by now, um, beginning Monday, there will be a, a mandate throughout Dane County to wear a face mask indoors. Um, and if you're outside of an establishment waiting in line, um, particularly if you can't social distance, um, you would have to do that. There are a couple exemptions for if you are in a restaurant while you are eating, you can take your mask off. But in general, if you are indoors, anywhere, public or private, um, and, and you need to be wearing um, a face mask. And the private, um, it applies to obviously not members of your own household, but if you have people over. Um, obviously, you know, we have to rely mostly on voluntary cooperation, just like we do with stop signs and, you know, most of the other laws we have, right? Um, we're not going to have people peering in windows, you know, you know telling people what to do. Um, but, you know, my message to folks um, has been and continues to be that, you know, this is what we have to do to show up for our neighbors. You know, in my role, I've been through many natural and, and, and other disasters that we've had to respond to, be it the explosion in some prairie, tornadoes, flooding, et cetera, illnesses in communities. And one of the things I always see is people come together and step up for their neighbors. And we need to recommit and regain that spirit we had really back in March when this was first upon us. And we realized that we're all in this together. And you know, with masks, we know we don't wear masks for ourselves. We wear it for our friends and our family and our community. Now, what we did as we were looking at the masking issue, it, it's become evident, you know, it, it is, as we know that throughout the pandemic, the guidance from the CDC has evolved when it comes to masking. And it's now recognized as an extremely effective way to help stop the spread, slow the spread of the virus. So particularly in Dane County over the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing just an explosion in cases, especially since we went to what we refer to as phase two, the opening of more um, businesses and bars and restaurants and allowing them to be at 50% capacity. We, and we've seen the contact, spread, um, contact tracing that most of the spread has occurred um, in bars and in gatherings. People are getting together, um, you, you know, be it indoors or outdoors and not masking up, but we saw a lot of it happening in bars. And we know, you know, the alcohol does not always equal good decision-making. And so first of all, we had to step back our orders and we, are, we have closed down bars for indoor service. They can do um, curbside pickup and outdoor with social distancing. Um, and we've had to pull back on our restaurant capacity to 25%. And that hurts. You know, there, there's a lot of, as, we're, as we were well aware, um, a lot of impacts in addition to the illness um, that, that COVID-19 causes um, in the measures that we have to do. So I see masking as both highly effective and impactful, while also being, you know, potentially our best route to be able to keep the economy at least somewhat open. Now, we looked at a number of issues before we issued the order because we were concerned, you know, as a community of over half a million people, um, that everyone had access to masks, that we had education um, throughout the community so people knew why we're, we were doing this and why it was important. And then we dealt with issues, um, you know, concerning, you know, concerns about racial profiling. And so the health department met with a number of community leaders, met with law enforcement um, to talk it through. 
And in our messaging, we're also talking to folks about, you know, don't make assumptions about people because they're wearing masks. And we're talking to the white community and saying, you know, be sensitive to the concerns that, that, that African Americans and Latinos might have if they're walking into a, a gas station or an open pantry with a mask on, right? Um, so there, there are a lot of these, these pieces and, and the need to build an infrastructure um, before we put the order in place. So we've reached out and are working with groups like, like Aaron's group, um, Lisa Payton Cares group, um, churches, community centers to do education throughout the community and to do dis distribution of masks. As of today, we have about 30,000 masks out in distribution um, among our partners who are gonna help um, with distribution. We have another 50,000 on order that are going to be coming here on Monday, um, cloth masks. So we wanna make sure again, that people know why we're doing this, know that we're doing it um, and have access to the masks. So, um, you know, we do receive some pushback as everyone on this call you know, is aware from, from all sides. I, I will tell you, my life has been very interesting the past four months. It's come from the left and the right and the center and everyone's angry. It's someone, someone was telling me that anger is the new national emotion, right? Um, and so, you know, there, there are people who are upset that we didn't do masking earlier. There are people upset that we're doing masking. Um, but what we try to do again is come back to remind people that our enemy is COVID-19. It's not our neighbors and it's not each other. And we need to rise as a community and be there for one another. You know, I saw my parents grew up, you know, in the Great Depression and World War II and they had food rationing and people were going off to war and dying. And they were eating, you know, you know greens from the yard, you know, dandelion greens for dinner. And so when we think about the level of sacrifice, sometimes it kind of boggles my mind a little when people complain about this because we're not asking you to take a hundred mile hike with a 50 pound backpack on, we're just asking you to put a little piece of cloth over your face. So, you know, I think kind of balancing the community spirit, we're doing this for a reason, it's something we can do. It, it shows us also we're not helpless, that, that, that there is something we can do that's very impactful. And, and I just, you know, the message again that I, I hope we can all reinforce is, you know, we need to come together as a community and realize that we're all doing this for one another and that this one day will be over. Hopefully a year from now, we're gonna be looking back and, and, and dissecting how we did when we're on the other side of it. But right now we still have a ways to go. And so um, we're happy that we were able to move forward with this in Dane County. And since we did, we're seeing a number of other communities um, start to look at it. I was very happy that <laughs> Governor Thompson, who's now heading you know, interim the UW system, is going to be requiring masking um, in UW facilities. I think Milwaukee just stepped ahead with their um, ordinance. Um, so um, again, the, the important part now is, as we were talking a little bit before the, uh, we went live, Aaron, is, is doing the education, especially among young yes. people, so they know why we're doing this and how important it is, and that this, this illness can impact not only them, but their parents and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. And I'm glad that you touched on the, the racial profiling piece. Um, as we stated before we went live, um, I, so I did receive 2,000 uh, masks from emergency management. Um, thank God I have those because I'm already seeing how important it is to have them on the spot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm at a convenience store. I see a car, a, car, uh, a white SUV. Um, uh, three African American and one Caucasian male in it. They all step out of the vehicle. None of them have mask on. So of course, me having mask in my car, I actually got out and I walked over to them, introduced myself, and I said, "Hey guys, I, I don't want you to get sick." So I gave them uh, all a mask. Well, I gave them a pack of masks. I said, three in the pack. So make sure you share those with your family members." Uh, the African American male, who was about 18, 19, he said what are these for? And I said, well, we, we don't want you to get sick. Why are you wearing that? And what are these for? And so I had to pause for a second, not to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, don't know what that young man's circumstances in life, maybe it's possible he hasn't even had access to a television. I don't know. But you know, I talked about the pandemic. I talked about the importance of having masks so that they don't get sick. Um, and that was kind of the conversation, all of them said thank you. Um, they were looking at the pack of masks like they had never used them before. But I had mine on, I pulled it off, showed them how to put it on. And, and that was kind of the end of it. But it spoke to 
bigger messaging that let's not assume that everyone is getting getting those messages. And uh, you want, we want to make sure that we continue to get that information out. So I appreciate you also sharing about the racial profiling because I did see a lot of videos being posted after the executive declaration or the extension was, was announced. So I started seeing people posting a lot of pictures with police officers following them mm -hmm. in stores when they were wearing their masks. So this is a really good time. Thank you again for coming on and sharing sure. um, because we want to make sure that we continue with this messaging and i hope that you know uh, obviously wisconsin continues to be uh, what i see is a leader we're constantly appearing to be on the front front lines of what the rest of the country is doing and we often seem to be taking a lead on some of these things so definitely but i want to make sure that um, anyone had a question for the county executive Dr. Thomas, Dr. Edwards, any questions? Good, good. Well, so silence is good, <laughs> you know. So um, kind of executive, any other information you feel you um, would like to share um, with the community? Because we are definitely going to be supporters and pushing and encouraging people to wear masks. I am proud to say we had our Black Men Run group this morning. We did about four miles and probably 99.9% .9 of the people we saw out working out and running or walking, they all had masks on, so. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I, I appreciate it, Aaron. And, and I think it's just more of what you're, you're talking about now. We have to continue through our outreach efforts to, to um, educate people and get masks out there. And, you know, please keep giving me your feedback, you know, particularly as an African-American man about the profiling um, piece of this. Because as I said, we've worked with um, Madison Law Enforcement and the Chiefs of Police Association in Dane County to you know, share concerns of folks um, with them about the profiling issue. But it's not just, you know, as you know better than I, it's not just law enforcement who does the profiling either. So, um, you know, please keep in touch with me about that piece of it and let me know if there's anything else I can do with that or other, other you know, Yes. This, this initiative. Excellent. Actually, actually, on, on that point, I wanted to know if the county exec, uh, executive uh, thought about, or maybe you have already plans to do this, uh, potentially using street teams mm -hmm. that can go into the community, like with what Aaron was just uh, identifying. Uh, if you have street teams that could go in the community, less from a, 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 a punitive standpoint, and going in and being able to walk around, mingle with people very easily, uh, and provide masks for people who don't have masks, and provide information like Aaron did uh, for persons who don't have information. I think in some communities they call them uh, violence interrupters when there's significant yeah. violence issues. And so for this one, it might be uh, uh, public health uh, interrupting. Yeah, no, that's that's good. And we have a version of that. And I don't know if it comes down to the actual street teams, but with working with groups, um, you know, in different communities and community centers and, and grassroots organizations who we're contracting with to do the education and distribution. Um, you know, we're doing that also with testing sites. We're doing testings in a lot of different um, communities in partnership with neighborhood organizations, neighborhood based organizations, especially in communities, lower income communities who might not, might not be as mobile. But you know, I like that idea, and I'm going to ask if it gets down to that level with, with the organization that's in place right now, because I, I like that concept. Thank you. Because I, I, at least the, the way I'm thinking about it is with these kind of structured spaces where community organizations have people coming in, and we mm -hmm. have testing sites, the people that we are most likely to, to, to reach in those spaces are the people who are themselves looking for help. Yeah. And the people who are not looking for help, young people who are not even yeah. thinking about this, are yeah. less likely to be reached because they're less likely to seek out that, that help. So if we have people like these roving, I, I think uh, uh, some other group may have had it during the protest, going in and trying to interrupt potential mm -hmm. disruptions in the protest. If we have yeah. these ununiformed, just regular people who are coming together and doing that work while still protecting themselves, of course, uh, that yeah. might be. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Damon, do you have any questions for the county executive before we move to you? I think you're muted. I think he's, you're muted, Damon. 
You're muted. Oh, there you go. There you I go. Was <laughs> say, no, I was going to say just thank you, Mr. Parisi. Just continue to do a great job representing this county, and we appreciate everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Definitely. Appreciate yeah, it. I concur. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, County Executive Joe, um, you, Parisi, you're welcome to hang out with us. I know that's your schedule. I can't imagine what you and Damon are up against, <laughs> um, but you're more than welcome to hang out as long as you can. Um, and Thanks. so, all right. Cool. I can Thank stick you. around for a little while. Yeah. Okay. That sounds Thank good. You. So we're going to shift over to Mr. Damon Boatwright, Regional President of SSM Health. Um, obviously, you see the logo on the back of our Men's Health Center. We are broadcasting live from the barbershop here. Um, we're going to continue to do that because what we are seeing with these black men walking in here holding their kids hand and they're all masks. We just love to continue to see that. So, uh, but Damon, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Aaron, for again, allowing me to be part of this wonderful group of panelists uh, that you've assembled again and appreciate you allowing us the opportunity to talk to this Facebook Live group and give everybody a sense of just uh, overall education and awareness uh, related to current events and what's going on. So thank you very much for allowing us the time. I really do appreciate that. Um, and I always hate uh, following Joe because Joe's so succinct and crisp and, and knowledgeable. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try my best to provide some uh, other information that he did not provide. So Aaron, let me just start with this. Let me just start with maybe a, a broader perspective than I'm gonna specifically talk about Wisconsin and this specifically Dane County. Um, and it also holds true for Milwaukee as well. Um, but I wanna sort of separate commentary uh, just from facts uh, for a minute. So um, since the last time I was on this Facebook Live, which is about a month and a half ago, actually, mm -hmm. uh, there has been a wake up uh, for America. Uh, related to balancing, opening up the economy. And we hear that narrative uh, and there's justification and good reason for wanting to open up the economy, but also balancing the reality of the coronavirus that's still among us. And the fact is, as we've tried to do both, tried to do our best to take appropriate precautions on coronavirus while opening back up, We've now seen surges in Phoenix, Arizona, Miami, Tampa, Florida, Austin, Dallas, Texas, Houston, and Los Angeles, just to mention a few. And there are several more hot spots popping up each day, each week. So that sort of forced us to understand that the reality of this virus clearly needs continual extra precautions as we try to open up the economy as best we can. Um, and while the increase in testing, just to give, to give people facts, the increase in testing has caught COVID-19 cases that have already existed, the fact of the matter is there's an increase in infections. That's indisputable. There's an in increase in infections going on right now. So the demographics is this, and this is what's playing out in all of those other states, and this is what could play out here in Wisconsin. It starts off with a younger population, about 18 to 28 years old, and they suffer less intense symptoms, uh, and they're less likely to be hosp hospitalized. That's sort of a false sense of security because we think, oh, well, the mortality rate's low, hospitalizations is low, we have nothing to worry about. But then what happens is what scientists call a chain of infection that will spread to the broader community. And then because those 18 year olds to 28 year olds have parents that are older and those parents have parents who are grandparents. And that's where you have a vulnerable population that exists, particularly if someone has underlying health conditions. I thought this and I was wrong, by the way. I, well, I was hoping, I was hoping that there was going to be a summer effect and what I mean by the summer effect that I talked about six weeks ago is the summer months, typically for the flu, you would see less flu-like symptoms in cases uh, in the summer. Corona is obviously different uh, than the flu. Uh, and we're still continuing to see a spread and no part of the country is immune from the potential surge. So what that all means is all the hospitals, all the health systems, 
and all of the government officials are really trying to do their best by following prudent, logical and rational guidelines, many of which come from the CDC, Center for Disease Control, and trying to find ways in which we can do sort of the simple things, right? Uh, things like mask, gloves, um, uh, testing. Uh, if you have the symptoms itself, those symptoms include fever, if you got over 100 degree fever, chills, cough, sore throat, runny nose, shortness of breath, chest tightening, loss of taste or smell, nasal congestion, headaches, severe fatigue, muscle pain. If you have any of those combination of symptoms, you really should look at trying to get tested. And there are situations where someone can be what they call asymptomatic. And um, Dr. Logan Edwards can probably explain that even more clearly than I. It's someone who doesn't seem to have symptoms, but they're still carrying the virus itself. And those individuals, just to reiterate what Joe Parisi talked about, you could be sick and not know you're sick. And so the reason for the mask, which I support 100%, by the way, is not so much to take away anybody's freedom or liberty or the, the, the change, uh, whatever groove you got going on with your own external appearance. Um, it is simply to protect you and to protect you from others. And particularly if their symptoms are not visible to all of you. Now, what does all this mean for Wisconsin? So although our cases are, are going up and certain counties are now considered more hot spots because the prevalence of COVID infection continues to rise and isn't really getting abated. We're still in a better shape overall than those other states that I sort of mentioned to you earlier. Now, this is where I'm biased. I like to believe because of the actions at the state level and the county level uh, and the city uh, to try to take um, uh, pull back on some of our reopening plans and place somewhat tighter restrictions on public and private gatherings. And what many other businesses are doing are screening their employees up front and making sure if anybody has any signs and symptoms, take them out of the workplace so that they can quarantine safely at home. I like to believe that those actions actually have worked. They've caused us to be a little bit more successful to date uh, than the other places. But again, we're not immune from the same exact things happening if we're not careful uh, as those other states. And so the hospitals are trying to balance too. We're opening up again more than we had before and now starting to do elective cases again and, and clinic visits in the medical group and in the clinics, but we're taking precautions. And so not just my health system, but Many health systems across Wisconsin are taking similar actions with uh, doing what they call antibody testing, screening for uh, signs and symptoms up front. Our employees are taking all of the appropriate precautions with infectious control techniques and standards and protocols and cleaning uh, the hospitals um, and all of the acute care areas. Uh, and then lastly, we're also uh, being able to uh, be very cautious uh, in terms of uh, looking at telemedicine um, and trying to do visits like we're doing it, sort of Facebook Live, if you will, and virtual. Uh, again, providing distance, but also being able to provide the appropriate screening necessary and to treat for symptoms uh, that if go unseen, it may flare up into something more serious a little bit uh, later. And so that's happening all across the state of Wisconsin. Um, and I think the health system will continue to take those measures uh, to be able to do that. We're working collaboratively at the county level, public health level, state level, uh, to make sure that if there are surges, we have the ability to, to exceed our current capacity and take on more patients. Um, but so far, with the exception of Milwaukee, um, hospitalizations due to COVID uh, seem to be controllable for now. Um, but that could change uh, anytime soon. Uh, so we're trying to be cautious. 
that's the key takeaway. Um, please educate yourself um, as to uh, the disease itself, who it impacts, and the signs and the symptoms. Please believe the science and believe the scientists. Um, they have it right. Um, do they have everything right? Uh, maybe not because they're still trying to study this disease. It's still early, um, but they are, uh, for the most part, uh, directionally correct uh, on everything uh, that they have predicted. Um, and, and I would rather err on the side of safety to protect more people um, and to see less people infected um, than, than uh, try to be overly liberal um, with hopes uh, that this is not impactful, and then it ends up uh, costing a lot more people uh, their life. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Aaron. I'll pause right there just for the interest of time, um, and then I'll see if there's any uh, questions. Yes, and then I'll just hand over back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Damon. And um, one of the areas, Damon, I, again, I appreciate uh, the feedback, but this, this is a question for Damon and, and um, the county executive. Um, what we're seeing that's happening in the South and the Southwest, uh, is there any information that's an indicator of why those particular areas are, are really hot right now? Because again, it was uh, um, the area, it was kind of the, the Midwest at one point, but now we've seen a shift to the South and Southwest. Is it because you think they open too soon or I, I don't know, what, is there any data or any information? It, it, so I, um, I'll start and then I'll let uh, Joe clean up anything that I get <laughs> wrong here uh, from his perspective. Um, but I, I will tell you, um, so I'm not gonna call any one state out, um, but, but if you look across many of the states that have seen their surges, then what you've seen is at the state level, and then even at the county and some city levels, the officials taking the position that the most important thing was to open up the economy and get everybody back out and about and having normal activity again. And in those places, there's empirical evidence to show that the infection rates then surged almost two, three weeks after those announcements that open things back up again. And many of you, if you watch TV or seen the news reports, I mean, you've seen pictures of crowded beaches, crowded restaurants, crowded bars, no one wearing um, a face mask, uh, and no one even practicing social distancing. Right. And, and in those areas, Aaron, that's where you have seen an influx, an immediate surge um, of cases. Now, this is the key. A lot of that has been in the youth, not all, but primarily it's been in the young. And so when we then say, or some would say, well, yes, infections have gone up, but it hasn't led to hospitalizations. It hasn't led you know, to high mortality rates. Well, they were saying that four weeks ago, but now you look today, that chain of infection I just mentioned earlier that then went from the young and almost resilient to those that have vulnerable secondary health conditions to being elderly, that's when you're now starting to see uh, hospitalizations now going up and, and mortality going up a little bit as well. So I, I like to believe that, well, I think evidence will show um, a lack of um, compliance uh, to the guidelines uh, that have been released by the CDC and others in, in appropriate safety precautions, I think that has led uh, to an increase in cases. Okay, excellent. Yeah, county executive, um, any take on the, as Damon stated? Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I think Damon nailed it. I mean, if from the empirical data scientific side of it, it's, it's just spot on. And, you know, I, I think the tragedy that's layered upon the tragedy that is COVID-19 is that for some reason, this response in the United States and in a couple other places, but mainly here has become so politicized. Um, this, is, this is a medical crisis, right? This is a human crisis. 
And, and, and the fact that, that, that politics, I mean, you know, if, I, if I'm having a heart attack, I'm not, I'm not gonna call Mark Pocan, I'm gonna call my doctor, right? <laughs> right. Um, as much as I like Mark, he's a great guy. Right. But, yeah. you, you know, so the politicization, if that's a word, of this crisis is, 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 in my opinion, driving exactly what Damon was talking about, that somehow if, if you belong to one party, you know, masking is ridiculous. And, and, and if you belong to another party, somehow it's implied that you don't care about the collateral economic damage. Mm-hmm. You know, I was watching, um, as I'm sure a lot of you do, looking at how other states and other countries have handled this. And, you know, Canada, for example, um, obviously a much smaller country, but they're having about half as many positive cases nationwide daily as we are in Dane County right now. Mm-hmm. And it's because they came together, as did a lot of other nations as a country. They did a very strict lockdown for a longer period of time. They all mask, but you had their conservative and liberal um, elected officials on the same page looking at the science, looking at the data, listening to healthcare professionals regarding what was best. And I saw very, I thought, revealing it's anecdotal, but kind of person on the street interview with someone in Canada, there was a couple and there, they were wearing masks and the person was interviewing them and saying, why do you wear, why are you wearing a mask and do you mind? And the person was kind of puzzled by the question. There, it was like, well, because there's COVID-19 and I don't want to give it to my neighbors. I, you know? And so it, you know, and maybe this kind of comes back to my original comments when I first started talking. I mean, I think if, 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 if there's one thing I'm trying to do, and I know all of you are, and if we can continue to do as a community is to get us back to, you know, focusing on the common good. None, none of this has anything to do with politics. And we've seen right. what starts to happen when politics drives decision making. It, 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 it results in tragedy. So, um, yeah, it's, it's so... Yeah, that's it. I mean, Damon was spot on in the science, and unfortunately, we know all too well what's happened to the politics of this situation. And right. I'm hoping that, unfortunately, maybe you know some of the folks in Texas and Arizona and Florida are going to learn the hard way um, mm-hmm. that, that that ignoring the virus doesn't make it go away. And I think the great irony in a lot of those political decisions are that I think the best thing we could have and could do for the economy is to get this virus under control. Right. So. You know, if you open up extremely slowly and mask up and do everything you need to do and not try to rush, at least you're going to be able to keep the economy going rather than having to shut back down and overwhelm our ERs, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's where we're at. And hopefully folks can, you know, learn some lessons and we can get back to acting, you know, mm-hmm. like we would like to if we were at a full potential as a nation. Right. And you know, with the uh, recent celebration of the 4th of July, um, I obviously from both of uh, Damon and um, the county executive standpoint, uh, do you guys anticipate any spikes, additional spikes, given that folks was out celebrating the 4th of July? Um, I saw a lot of the videos and photos, and it did appear that folks in Wisconsin was social distancing and, and wearing a mask, but obviously that's just a few videos. Uh, any information coming down the pike regarding that? Potential spikes? Mine would just be kind of anecdotal. One of the reasons we wanted to um, you know, announce what we did when we did re- regarding tightening the restrictions initially um, was to get out ahead of what we thought might be coming. I think locally, maybe in the state, but certainly locally, there has been a bit of a wake-up call. As, as you probably know, we saw a huge surge in numbers of people coming to the Alliant Energy Center to get tested. You know, we went from five to 800 a day to thousands of people. So I think some people maybe kind of thought, oh, shoot, maybe I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing. Right. So again, I'm hoping that was a wake-up call. Um, you know, around here, I think people, there are always going to be folks, you know, I'll go by the basketball court and see a bunch of kids playing and I just want to <laughs> want to explode. But right. I think in general, 
things went around here, you know, just anecdotally pretty well around on the fourth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank thank you both, um, uh, Damon Boatwright, Regional President of SSM Health, uh, County Executive Joe Parisi. Um, and if you guys want to stick around, obviously you know um, this that this is your home as well. Um, we respect your time. So, um, and if uh, you have any questions, feel free to chime in chime in before you take off. But I also want to make sure that. We do a few announcements um, because we have our Edgewood College nursing students. They are um, listening in with this, so we appreciate them. Normally, we would have them in the men's center here, taking blood pressures or doing whatever we can do, but circumstances are saying that we have to look at this a little differently. And then we have uh, uh, Dr. Thomas has invited some guests. I'd like for him to share who that who those individuals are. Um, if you want to, hey, Aaron, Dr. Yes. I mean, let me just do this. I won't be able to stay um, the whole entire time. I have another uh, meeting I have to attend to here shortly. Um, but I do want to say this maybe in closing. Um, all of our uh, officials, I mean, Joe is just one of them, one of the best, uh, by the way, but uh, all of our officials at the state level, public health, et cetera, they're just trying to do their best. And I just want, if I had any message, I just want to say this, everybody's trying to do their best. Are we going to get it right 100% of the time? Uh, probably not. Um, not any of us have any experience going through a pandemic uh, that we haven't seen since 1918. Um, but, but we really are trying to balance, um, trying to keep people safe, uh, trying to keep people well, uh, with trying to also then when we have opportunity, try to provide some new sense of normalcy uh, for life moving forward until we're really able to get our arms around this right. particular disease uh, yeah. itself. Um, and so, uh, yes, I know everyone's asked a lot of each individual, each American to be very patient, um, but we still need everyone to be cautious uh, moving yeah. forward. Uh, not just to protect yourself, but to protect your neighbor, protect your friend, protect your family member um, in this. And, and and just one last thing that Joe said, which I just want to reinforce before I leave, we can get through this together. We can get through this together. There's been many moments in time where we've been able to sort of cross uh, political aisles and, and, and cross the racial divisions, uh, even religion um, and gender and come together uh, as a society and a group, um, and, and we are able to sort of defeat anything that's in front of us. I think if we do the same thing this time, just like other nations have done, uh, we will be able to get through this as well. So thank you, Aaron, again, for pulling this together. I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to talk with this group. Absolutely. Thank you, Damon. Appreciate it. Yeah. And so uh, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Thomas, when I have you, we usually have you introduce yourselves earlier, but you know, we wanted to acknowledge the time commitments from uh, Damon Boatwright and County Executive Joe Parisi. So you guys wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves and then we'll talk a little bit more about, obviously with the flu season coming, we're seeing now on Facebook and some other social media outlets that folks are now starting to say, wait a minute, the flu season is just around the corner. And so there's a sense that there's a little fear that's starting to creep in. And so we're gonna have Dr. Thomas and Dr. Edwards speak to that a little bit on how do we calm some of the fears and some of the things that they can do as self-care practices. So we'll start with you, Dr. Thomas, and then we'll go to Dr. Edwards. Yeah, I forgot to unmute myself, sorry about that. Uh, just by way of introductions, uh, Alvin Thomas, uh, Assistant Professor uh, in the School of Human Ecology, uh, the, uh, Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My areas are, of course, uh, fatherhood, father engagement, positive youth development, and the strengthening of Black families. Excellent. Dr. Edwards. Dr. Logan Edwards, I'm an assistant professor of health education and health behavior um, in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and that's for the Department of Kinesiology. I'm also a lecturer of health behavior and health equity here at UW Madison, and my research and service projects and focuses 
are on mental health literacy and bringing mental health support services to uh, marginalized or vulnerable populations um, who lack access to mental health support services. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, I want to make sure I recognize some of the folks that are joining us. I'm getting a lot of text messages. This is what happens when you have uh, Damon Boatwright and the county executive on, but folks from Milwaukee, Racine, uh, Davenport, Iowa, uh, Des, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, and Detroit, Michigan, all chiming in. And I know that um, uh, Dr. Thomas has some friends that are joining us as well. I won't take that thunder. I'll let you do do the honors. <laughs> as always, we have we have a, a, a pretty good contingent from the Caribbean, from Saint Lucia, and from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we have people over from the, the from the of course from the Midwest, uh, Minnesota, uh, from the East Coast, and I think we have a few people from uh, Switzerland and England, uh, the UK. Uh, we also ha actually have with us uh, a, a colleague of mine, a medical doctor at one of the University of Maryland hospitals. Um, we also have a, a, a really um, well-known author, educator, activist who works on advancing social justice issues. Uh, he is the co-founder of A Call to Men. Uh, Tony Porter is sitting in and listening and joining this discussion with us. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're happy to have all of you present and listening and contributing. Yeah, I tried to get get uh, get uh, uh, Mr. Porter's ear before he got out of here. He was here for the uh, the domestic abuse intervention services, the big um, meeting or celebration that they had here, and uh, his presentation was absolutely dynamic. So thank you, um, uh, Tony Porter, for for that. So, um, guys, let's talk a little bit about how do we prepare and then calm some of the fears that we're starting to see with the flu season around the corner. And now you had flu season, you have the pandemic. What, give us some self-care tips that we can share with uh, the audience that they can take back and you know maybe reassure their family members and friends. I think, so, so, so I'll, I'll just jump into it. Um, I think one of the things that I see happening and I, I, you, you, you kind of hear it, it's like a little bit of a, like a bug in your ear, almost like the cicadas. Uh, there's this ramping up of uh, fear and uh, feelings of being overwhelmed and panic. And I think that that is probably a significant enemy. You want to be very careful not to stop to panic. So we, we hear about this uh, masking that's going to start happening as of Monday. And people may start thinking, or all people hear about uh, these uh, surges. That these are calls to be more aware, to be more active, to be more proactive in some cases, not calls to panic and to suddenly despair. So I, I would say to people, if you have not been following the guidelines, then this, these developments are not meant to scare you, but they should be a wake up call to you that you should be doing now what you were not doing before. If you've been doing what you should have been doing before, then great, keep doing it and encourage others to do it. Encourage others to follow the guidelines, tighten up some of the guidelines in areas where you were not tightening it up. Maybe you were going to the supermarket uh, and not wearing a mask or wearing a mask only at certain times. Um, so this might be a space for you to start learning how to tighten up some of those guidelines. So again, the, the idea is calm down. The sky is not falling. We're still in a pandemic. Yes. Uh, these are still very difficult, uh, ch um, challenging times. Yes. But that does not mean that things are out of control. The world is not on fire. There are still things that we can do. We are still far from the brink. We have a lot of latitude uh, in things that we can do. And we've not begun to start in, in many cases to start doing the things that we can do. And one of the easiest things that you can do is to wear a face mask when you're in public. Yes. Do that, 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 that washing of hands. And then for yourself, as far as mental health is, uh, me mental health wise, uh, you want to take that time for yourself. Find something pleasurable to do. That's also safe. Uh, engage with people. So we're, I think uh, I had a, a discussion with um, 
um, Richie, Dr. D D Dr. Richard um, from the Center for Healthy Minds. And I liked how he put it. He said, this is not, we're not social distancing. We're physical distancing. So we can't be physically next to each other, but the social element doesn't have to be distanced. We can still be in close connection with other people socially by using social media, by smoke signals, however you have to do it. You can still connect with other people and still feel that love with other people without necessarily breaching uh, physical space and um, increasing your likelihood of, um, of infection. So definitely take, take time to, for yourself and for your family as well. Excellent. And Dr. Edwards. Yeah, Aaron, I, I'm mindful of, of you saying that this uh, particular um, support group was going to focus on on the element of fear today. And it's that, that word fear that I want to unpack a little bit and um, for myself, how I think about it. And I think that a lot of times, most of the time, fear is coming from um, the unknown, the, the uncertainties, and then what Dr. Thomas was just speaking to about feeling out of control, um, like, like you don't have any way to, to exert power or help yourself in this situation. And we can kind of debunk some of that because, and, and then hopefully subside some of those fears because we do know what to do. So there isn't just an uncertainty about what do we do. Um, uh, there's not this missing knowledge on um, how do we protect ourselves and others. We, we do have a knowledge and um, some certainty around what we can do, what is within our control to help combat that fear. And for myself personally, um, when I get a little bit afraid or insecure about the situation, when I am out and about, um, I might get paranoid. I might think, well, we don't know everything yet. So maybe I am um, contracting the virus and maybe I am gonna be hospitalized because of this. Um, and I think to myself that I'm not out of control and I'm not um, completely ignorant to, to what to do um, to protect myself. And then that helps me gain more of that, that power back that says, no, I can control some of this by social distancing or by physical distancing. I can put on a mask. I can practice respiratory etiquette and I can practice good, healthy hand hygiene. Um, and all of those things subside some of the fears or the paranoia that I might feel. Um, so that's my first antidote to how do we combat the fear by behaving how the public health experts are are recommending and advising us to do. And then you, you exude some more control that way. Um, so that's, I, I think that's what's getting at a lot of the fear that I'm hearing is people are just uncertain on what to do um, and then are forgetting that there is something you can do that you're not powerless um, and we're not helpless as Joe was saying in the, in the very beginning of our conversation. There's something that we can do and that power and that helpfulness um, I think helps to subside some of that fear. Um, so for myself personally, I, I think that, um, Joe and Damon said a lot of good stuff in the very beginning that we can continue to elaborate on, but as they were talking, um, I was really just re being reminded of how people need to still behave as if they have the illness. Um, they need to behave as if they are contagious. That's, that's what I do when I go out. And I do that out of respect for others. I'm going to keep that six to 10 feet distance from people as if I'm going to be transmitting the virus that I have. I'm going to wear the mask um, in case I'm transmitting the virus. Um, I'm going to, if I don't have a mask on, but I'm 10 feet away, I'm still going to be mindful and respectful that I'm not gonna be talking and yelling and breathing in people's faces. I'm going to behave as if I have the virus. Um, and I think if everybody keeps that mindset, then that will just help feed some of those healthy behaviors that we know can help prevent ourselves and other people from contracting it. Yeah, excellent points, gentlemen. You know, as I shared earlier about engaging with the young men um, and giving them masks, uh, I was caught off guard with the question that he's, what, what, of, what are these for? What are these masks for? Um, it again brought me right back to the messaging has to continue. It has to be on point, but we also can't shame people because they may not be aware of what's going on. And so one of the things that we're going to be um, taking part in next week 
Um, so again, I said our emergency management gave us oh, over 2,000 masks to, to, to you know, make sure that when we are engaging with individuals that don't have masks, you know, we want to make sure that they're doing what they can do to take care of themselves. So we have a group of um, Black men that will be patrolling a lot of the parks great great neighborhood over by Allied, um, Darbo Worthington. So we'll be patrolling those areas. And as we see young folks without masks, you know, we're gonna come out like we're Santa Claus and we're gonna be giving out masks. Um, it is a commitment that we are uh, taking on. And the question that I would have for, uh, for, the, for, you, for the panelists and our guests, when we encounter someone that may be resistant, you know, um, just maybe resistant, is there anything that you guys can share, particularly if there's others that are listening, anything you can share that will help people feel a little more confident by just approaching someone and saying, hey, I notice you don't have a mask, here's a mask. Is there anything you guys can offer? So I, I would, so you, you know, Aaron, I am all about language. So I would say first, <laughs> The, 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 the idea of patrolling streets has a certain connotation as if there's a top-down kind of uh, authority point. Kind of piece. So as we're occupying that space, as we're walking through, as we're running, as we're doing whatever we're doing, so let's focus on the things that we're actually doing to connect to other people. And as we're doing those things, we encounter people and from a space of love and concern, we see that they're that that they're not protected, and we much like we would do if we saw a dog in a trapped vehicle. We would be concerned, and even if that dog may potentially be barking and acting aggressively, our response would still be to try to do something to protect that dog, because we understand that this dog may be acting aggressively because of of of. of of its current situation. Not that we're saying that people are dogs, definitely is not my, is, is, is not my, uh, my, my connection. What I'm saying is first and foremost, we have to connect to others, to people as people, first and foremost, not as a person without a mask, but as a person, period. Uh, so we're going in, not, oh, you, you don't have a mask, why don't you have a mask? That's more of a shaming kind of a, a, a judgmental <laughs> sense versus, hey, how are you doing? Figure out who this person is to begin with. How, how are you doing? How's your day going? And then, oh, do you, do you need a mask? Because it may well be that they need a mask and can't find a mask or can't afford a mask or can't get a mask. Mm -hmm. So approaching from a question, I don't know what's going on and I want to kind of help, but I'm not going to tell you, can I help you? Because then that means that I, you have something that I don't have and it suddenly creates an inequity, mm -hmm. a disparity. So do you need a mask? The person might say, no, I don't need a mask. Great, there's your entree for a conversation. And you can tell them why you're wearing a mask, provide information, provide discussion while still engaging in that, six, that, that, that uh, physical distancing. And if the individual does need a mask, then you can provide a mask if you have one. And if you, if, if after you've provided the mask, it also gives you the connection now to do other things with that individual. So you might find out that they may have other things that might be going on. And you may be able on a person-to-person -person level, be able to connect with them and provide them either the direct resource or provide them with the connection that's gonna help provide that resource. So I would say again, from just, just from a very uh, base level to approach people first as human beings who mm -hmm. want to do the best. And that's usually what, where, where people are operating from. They're mm -hmm. operating from the best of intentions with the best possible resources that are available to them. And so trying to identify where, the, where people are, both mm -hmm. from intention and resource availability before we step in and try to do anything. Right, right. Thank you for that clarity. I struck down patrolling. <laughs> and we will be visiting. <laughs> great, great advice. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Edwards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to piggyback on that, I, I think that um, 
um, asking asking folks questions um, that show that you care is always a, a better approach than making statements that show that you're judging them. Um, okay. And asking people, as Dr. Thomas just said, uh, first off, would you like a mask? If you've got the ability to just hand out masks to folks, I think that's a great thing to do and, and, and do that. Um, ask them if they would like a mask and that you'd be happy to give them one. Um, if they say they don't want one because they don't believe in wearing them, then you can, again, keep asking questions that show that you care or that show that you're at least recognizing the humanity in this person to find out how their brain thinks the way it does or why their mind has decided upon that decision. And you're trying to curiously just figure it out so you can understand if you're willing to have that conversation. Ask them if there's some experience that they've had that made them choose not to wear a mask. Is there something they're listening to? Um, is there some other role model or... Um, type of relationship or relationships in their life that that they are modeling that has led to them not to want to wear a mask just kind of get down to the to the bottom of it um not accusing not judging but you're you're genuinely being curious um trying to figure this out out of a spirit of caring and not out of spirit of, of judging um that's that's always great advice so i appreciate dr thomas mentioning that um also to kind of pick up a little bit on what joe was saying that um, the, the masks and the, the physical distancing, these are not restrictions on our freedom. And I think that using that language and giving that insight is helpful too, that these are actually instruments of freedom um, and instruments of opening the economy back up and opening up social gatherings again so that we can congregate and meet with our friends without worrying or sit in classrooms or um, get back to some sense of normalcy. The way that we're going to get to that quicker and the way that our freedoms or our liberties are going to be experienced quicker is by wearing the masks and by physical distancing um, and by doing some of the other um, um, health behaviors that that we know so far work to curb this illness so um, just kind of reframing that language that these aren't restrictions this isn't being told what to do these are these are instruments to to your health to your freedom and to the economy backing up, opening back up and instruments to um, some sense of normalcy again. Um, so I, I just agree with, with Joe on that and with Dr. Thomas on how language matters and how you approach that in both words and in tone is gonna matter. So just put some thoughts into that um, before you just start talking to somebody um, and, and approaching folks. Um, right. I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, go ahead. If I could jump in there, and the two things I would add to, to, to kind of this, this kind of amorphous growing conversation is one, you, you, you don't want to go out there and have these conversations without having yourself stopped and done some of your own introspection. Right. So the first time you're talking to somebody about these things should not be when you meet them on the street. Mm -hmm. You should have sat down and thought about these things. What would I say if, if this was a response I got? What would be my response? Because we also have our own places that we're coming from with the things that we believe. We have the basis for our belief systems and we can sometimes become very defensive of those beliefs that we have, even whether they're based in science or in what you've been taught and what, 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 what you've grown up with. We, 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 we find both purpose and meaning in those things. And if, a, if another individual goes counter to it, we almost can, uh, uh, the automatic response is to try to defend it because we, we perceive it as being attacked. And so one, to practice those conversations before you have them in public with people. And two, know when to stop the conversation. Right. So you're having a conversation with somebody about uh, giving them a mask and wanting to give them this mask uh, and you, you've been going back and forth about it and you realize this person is really stuck in where they are and are not willing to move beyond that. Is it really useful for you at this point to continue pushing them? Because now it's no longer about the mask and their safety. It's now become two opposing viewpoints, two opposing ideologies. And the mask is not about ideology. It's about safety, life and death. So you, 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 you engage in the discussion that's going to allow you to provide some nuggets of information. Know what these specific nuggets of information you're going to provide are. Know what they are, provide them. And if your discussion seems to be going beyond the discussion around safety and preservation of life, know how you're going to end it. End it amicably and move on. It may well be 
Well, if, 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 if you don't mind, I, I, I'd like to leave this mask with you. Mm-hmm. And that's enough. And they, they can now go on with the physical mask and armed with additional information that you've provided to them. And they can think through it and maybe come to their own decision. Yes. But as long as, they feel, as long as people feel like you're pushing something on them, they're going to keep pushing back. Mm-hmm. And if, if right. two of you are pushing, there's no, 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 no ground is being covered. Oh, absolutely. I, I was just going to mention, Dr. Thomas, and ending it on good terms is always a way to, they're, they're going to leave with a mask, as you just said, um, and they're going to leave with a, with, a, with a positive impression of a person. Um, because if you're giving them a negative impression, um, they're going to associate your behavior, your beliefs, and your ideas as negative too, and not want to participate. So if you end that on good terms and say, hey, pra- practice saying in the, in the midst of that controversy, at the very end of that conversation that, okay, like I, I respect your opinion. I just wanted to talk to you about it and ask you about it because I care about you and because I care about our community. Um, but here's a mask, I've got somewhere to go. Uh, you know, be, be well, be healthy, and then leave them with a positive experience of that conversation that they just had. And at least it'll get them thinking, they've got a mask to protect themselves, but absolutely always end on good terms and remind them at the very end that it's because you care um, mm-hmm. about people and you care about your community. And that's just why you wanted to ask. It wasn't to argue or to chastise them. It was really just out of concern and care. Wow, no, very powerful. Yes, sir, uh, Jill. Thanks, Aaron. I was wondering if I could ask a, a question of Dr. Edwards and Thomas. First of all, I appreciate you guys so much. And every time I'm at an event with you, I feel like I learn so much and it, I, I, I'm just very grateful. And I, I'm, I'm thinking as, as you're talking about fear, and if you recall, when I first started talking this morning, I was talking about all the anger that is out there right now. Um, certainly that I encounter, and I'm sure others encounter um, more than I really ever have in, in my lifetime. And I'm wondering, it, it almost makes sense to me that at the, at the root of that anger is fear and, 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 and concern. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or advice about folks dealing with that level of anger that's in the community right now, you know, from, from various folks for, for, for various reasons, um, you know, and if you have any suggestions for me personally as a leader and, and what I can do and what I can do better to help um, help reassure the community and just deal with that anger in general, particularly if it is coming from a place of fear. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I can I can jump off, and then I'm sure Dr. Thomas has got some great things to say in this in this category. Um, I, I think that it's it's always good to acknowledge that that anger and that fear, um, and to and to say things that are validating, as if you know, like a lot of people are angry about this right now, and I understand that. Um, there's a lot of people that that are afraid. Um, like like I am or perhaps like you are or can can be angry about this like I have been and like you seem to be um so I acknowledge that and I I'm, I'm here for that um and then that's kind of when some of the open-ended questions start um can you talk to me a little bit about um where you think your fear is coming from or why you have an angry response to this um and and just listening listening to that validating what they're saying asking questions to try and get down to what experiences led them to their beliefs or to their behaviors. Uh, For me personally, that always works at calming some of those strong emotions. Um, But but Joe, you're absolutely right. I I think that keeping in mind what's underneath the surface of that anger is, is always the first step because then you can address the fear, you can address the pain, um, and then you can be in a space to ask questions that are open-ended um, and you can give positive validating feedback. Um, and then as Dr. Thomas and I were just saying, always ending it on good terms. I, I think that the goal is always just to keep it peaceful and keep it positive um, and keeping it human by, by understanding that this person has beliefs and experiences that came from, came from something before you walked into this conversation and you're trying to get at those. You're not trying to address the immediate um, anger or fear that's in your face. And I think that asking open-ended questions, um, keeping it positive, ending on good terms are some of those first three steps in those conversations. So th- there's, there's this uh, theory called the frustration aggression hypothesis. Uh, the frustration hy- aggression hypothesis frustration aggression hypothesis at its basis, at 
very basic level, even at the biological level, it says essentially that if your attempt to reach a particular goal or goals continues to be frustrated, eventually there's going to be some level of aggression. And aggression that remains unexpressed, unprocessed, uh, eventually becomes rage. Mm. Rage that re- rage and aggression that remain unprocessed, unexpressed, eventually spills over into violence. So at the core, it's a lot of what Dr. Edwards talked about. Coming down to what is the origin of the frustration? And for some people, it's the perception that they are invisible. And so mm-hmm. we that with, a, with a, num- a number of different groups of different groups in our community, we say, people, you don't see us, you don't hear our voice. We're dying, we're suffering, and you don't seem to hear. That's frustration. And when that frustration builds, eventually it's going to become aggression. When that aggression builds, it's going to become rage. With regard to some of the mass issues, there's also the idea of not being heard. So you, you, you're talking down to us. You're professoring over us. You're trying to tell us what to do. You're trying to do these things on us versus you're not versus actually listening to what we're saying. And so that, that's where in those conversations, the important thing is to make sure you, you know what message you want to pass on to the individual in the conversation. You have these specific nuggets like I talked about of information that you think, of public health information that you want to pass on. Wear the mask, this is how you wear it, wash your hands, keep the six feet apart. You have these four or five pieces that you want to make sure you, you, you keep hitting over and over and over again in the conversation. But the other person has their own messaging that they may want to hit over and over again. And if you keep pushing without allowing them to tell you what they want to tell you, or without them getting the feeling, the impression that you have heard them. Because it's one thing to listen, it's another thing for somebody to feel heard. And so mm-hmm. often uh, when I have conversations that are, not necess- that are not necessarily the most, that don't seem the most uh, profitable, I stop talking mm-hmm. and I let the individual talk. And sometimes they go on and on and on and that's usually because they felt like they've never had a chance. They've never had that space before. And so they go on and on and on and on and just keep going. And at the end of all of it, I may still not agree with anything that you that with most of what you have just said, but I will still tell you, thank you very much for your opinion. Thank yes. you very much for sharing that with me. In other words, you have a voice, you have a choice in what you want to believe, and you've chosen to believe those. Thank you for, for sharing that with me. I'm not saying I agree with it, right. but I hear you. And that gives people that a, a, a little bit more of a space to say, oh, well, at least you're listening to me. I can Absolutely. feel a little bit better about actually listening to your heritage. And that's usually that first step uh, to, um, to, to actually having a real conversation. Now that's different from, a, from an individual right off the bat saying, I don't want anything you have to say, I have my belief. And, just wants to shut down the conversation. That, that takes a, a different set of strategies to kind of break through that kind of a situation. But in a, a more general mm-hmm. sense, you, you want to let, let people leave feeling validated, feeling like they've been listened to, and feeling at the end of the day, humanized. Yes, absolutely. It, it maintains their, their dignity. It maintains their respect. And at the end of the day, that's a lot of what everybody just once in these conversations. And then that is gonna help quell some of that anger that people will express too. Just by the fact that they are feeling seen, they're feeling heard, you are maintaining their respect and their dignity as a human being, that's good. They don't have anything to be angry about anymore. If you're kind of presenting that, that energy or, or, that, um, or that posture to them, uh, it, it's just gonna help calm down some of that anger. Um, I, I think it's helpful for folks to like, like us to remember that you can listen without agreeing. And a lot of people don't, don't abide by that very simple understanding. And they're never taught that or told that so explicitly, but you can listen all day and not agree. It doesn't mean you have to get angry or that you have to, to lecture somebody and kind of put them in their place. That's exactly what's gonna lead them to get more angry and more disrespecting and shut down and not, not listen to you. 
and then you're not going to feel heard. And that's where you just get into these these controversies. And I also think it's it's helpful, fellas, to to keep in mind that it's always better to to ask for permission to give advice in those situations or mm -hmm. ask for permission to share knowledge as opposed to just tell somebody what to do or just give somebody knowledge unsolicited. Um, you, uh, nine times out of 10, probably 10 times out of 10 that I've used that tactic in any type of um, argument or disagreement. I've never been told, no, I don't wanna hear what you have to say or no, don't, don't tell me um, what you would do or don't tell me this or that. Not nine times out of 10, it's always a uh, sure, sure. Like, what do you have to say? Just because you're giving them the power to allow you to get to, to speak or to give information. And that's always a better spot to meet them. So it's, mm -hmm. I understand that, I understand why you're not wearing a mask because you feel like maybe it's not masculine or maybe you feel like it's a restriction of your freedom or you feel like it's pointless. There's a lot of folks that feel that way. I understand that. Is it okay if I tell you why I wear my mask? Nine times out of 10, they're probably going to say, sure. Um, and then you say, I look at it as a personal choice. It's, an, it's a way for me to exercise my freedom. It's a way for me to get to, to, get to freedom faster or to open up the economy faster. Um, I look at it as my ability to show folks that I care for them. I look at this as a sign of kindness or as a gesture of kindness and compassion um, for other people. That's why I wear mine, because I used to maybe feel it was a restriction on my freedom too. I used to feel that it was taking away from my masculinity too. Uh, is it okay if I tell you how I got over that? It's just a softer approach. It's a, it's a way to get them to respect you and a way to show that you respect them. And you're just gonna break ground and get through to them easier than trying to lecture to them um, or try to, try to berate them and address their anger instead of their, instead of their fear or their um, uncertainties or instead of their anger or pain. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so many connections were just made as you all were talking, beginning with the county executive question and then your responses. Uh, I, I, I could not, and I have to share this, I could not shake the fact that when I worked as a police officer, everything that you guys just shared almost counter to almost how we're trained to interact. Um, very powerful what you guys just shared. And then I also made some notes, motivational interviewing, um, kind of a lot of what um, uh, Dr. Uh, Edwards was referring to. Um, so more than anything, I'm going to continue to share this. I'm gonna share it with my law enforcement friends um, because they need to hear exactly what you guys just put out there because oftentimes it is the number one complaint that I hear from my young black men when we talk about engaging with police officers. They don't respect me, they don't hear me. And so excellent feedback. I will make sure that I continue to share this with those groups and uh, wow, very powerful stuff. So thank you, County Executive, for kind of leading that off because this is why we do this. This is our mental health, Black Males Mental Health Wellbeing Support Group. And I think that a connection was just, and I know that there's others out in the community that are sitting there making this connection. Very powerful feedback. So. Uh, any other questions we have about, I'll always give that update on time. We have about 13 more minutes. Anything else you guys want to close with? You know, I, I'll bring up a point and just see what, what you folks think or what you've heard. So you've seen some early kind of preliminary data on, on um, who's wearing masks versus who's not. And of course, it's the men who are less likely to wear masks than it is uh, women from some of the studies I've seen. And that's just true with men in their healthcare. Uh, we, we typically, statistically anyway, are, are much less likely to, to be proactive about it um, for a whole slew of reasons. And I think that one of those big reasons is the masculinity thing, which is what Aaron and Dr. Thomas and I address all the time about how uh, re, redefining um, or I guess first uh, breaking down old ideas about what manhood and masculinity is and then redefining it as, as somebody who addresses their mental and emotional health, who expresses their emotions um, and who takes care of their health um, and in this context by, by wearing a mask. So I'm curious if, if um, Aaron, Joe, 
Dr. Thomas, if, if you've heard some of those same um, re early reports about men having more difficulty wearing them, and then maybe more specifically, um, um, what types of men, or are you seeing that it's a masculinity issue? Um, wh what are some of the things that you're hearing? And maybe we can talk about that for five minutes. Hmm. So I've, I've, I've heard some, some of the same stuff, but I think that, it, that that's a, a more aggregated approach. I think, I think the, 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 findings, the findings can be a bit more granular. Um, I think um, when you start dividing this down to some of its component parts, about looking at some of the intersections of identities. So male and African-American, male and Latino, male uh, and Native American, male, African-American, rural, African-American, low income, African-American, high income, middle income. You start to further subdividing some of these uh, aggregated spaces and you start to see differences. Um, I think, but to, to kind of step back from it, so I, I, I'm not necessarily pushing against the masculinity argument. I think that definitely is part of it. But that's been, that's been a long argument. A long uh, case has been made all the time about everything to do with men's health and men's mental health. That men are less likely to, to, to use health, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's the usual. I think, though, um, this, cre this presents an excellent space. And if Madison has to be the space where it starts, this creates an excellent opportunity for us to do a number of different things. One, to invest financially in the community for long term, and two, to address the mental health issues and, of course, the physical health issues around masking and these, those other spaces. What about taking the idea of masking, taking the idea of COVID related uh, precautions and translating it to that segment of the population. So making masks look more like something a man would want to wear. Mm -hmm. So taking these masks and quote unquote, masculinizing them, <laughs> whatever, wh wh whatever that means. And what about providing the finances for one or two uh, groups within the community who would take the lead on doing that and then distributing those masks in the community. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would put my, my I, don't have, I don't have money, but I'd put, <laughs> I'd put my 25 cents of my, my quarter on that we would potentially see an increase in men wearing masks. So you start having camo masks and whatever, whatever masculinization you do for those masks, and then you start distributing them. Right. We would see, uh, I, I think we, we, we would see something different happening. And Absolutely. Something in Madison, you can export that to the rest of the country. Absolutely. Something something as <laughs> as obvious as just putting real men wear masks on the mask, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And getting yeah. that message out there. Great point. Great point. There was a question that was raised, and we actually touched on this, I believe, in session one two, or two when we first started. Uh, but the question is, uh, would the panelists pr please provide advice on how? Um, they interact with people who were diagnosed with COVID, nine, COVID um, but due to fear of stigma, um, they're reluctant to disclose their diagnosis. We talked about that, I believe it was session one or two, um, but can we revisit that? Because um, that's a huge question when we talk about the stigmas of mental health in our community, the stigmas of, of some being gay, you know, right, uh, right. let's talk about that a little bit. Well, what, I, what I first think is that you're, you're you're doing the community a great service by by telling contact tracers um, what your status is and where you've been and who you've been around. That is a great that is an extension of love and kindness and service to the community. I, that's my first piece of advice: is is look at your disclosing of if your um, uh, COVID nineteen st positive status as an act of service to the community, um, as, as even your duty. To, to, that's how you take care of other people. Um, other things, wearing a mask and social distancing is how you also take care of other people. Um, but if you do contract COVID-19, an extension of that taking care of others and taking care of your community through love and through kindness is through revealing that and giving all the details you can so that contact tracers can do their job and help also um, take care of the community in their way. I think it would be a, a really beautiful thing, uh, Aaron, uh, if 
individuals who have been, we, we see it a lot with the celebrities doing it. Uh, if individuals who have contracted COVID-19, especially young people uh, could release short videos yeah. that explain their views before, mm -hmm. talk about how they got it and their experience with it. One, it humanizes it. Nothing is as powerful as the story of one individual. The individualization of pain and suffering is a powerful, powerful message. We can talk about 3 million people having contracted COVID-19. Most of us won't even think twice about that. 3 million, I don't, I don't know what 3 million people looks like. That means nothing to me. But when an individual shows up on camera and says, this is who I was before. This is how I was acting. This is how I got COVID-19. Here are my experiences, my personal experiences. And we see a groundswell of those videos, a groundswell of those stories coming out. Mm -hmm. That is undeniable. Yeah. You, 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 you can't deny 10,000 people coming out and saying, here is my story. I am, I am Joe Nobody from nowhere in the country. And this is my experience, two minutes. I am Miss Nobody with no ex from nowhere in the country with this experience. How do you deny these experiences? Thousands of them just beginning to swell up. Suddenly people start to take it a lot more seriously. Right, so, wow. So those of you who have caught COVID before, you have a powerful role that you can play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. You know, there was actually a nurse, I believe in um, New York, um, that when she was interviewed, her statement was, if you don't like wearing masks, you're going to hate wearing a ventilator. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it was so powerful because obviously as you started to talk, that jumped in my mind, you know, that boy, if that's not to the point and clear, you know, so again, thank you gentlemen for sharing. Um, we have, looks like five more minutes left. Uh, I definitely wanna give, um, you know, County Executive uh, another few minutes if you have any last words that you'd like to share. Thanks, Aaron. You know, actually not really. I'm really <laughs> learning a lot and enjoying listening um, to, to the conversations. I'm just really grateful to be here today. I, I've, I've learned a lot. And, you know, it's, I want to thank you for doing this because, you know, I'll be honest with you, I feel a lot better right now than I did before I hopped on this Zoom today. I mean, it's really empowering to be able to make these connections as we're mm -hmm. distancing, as, as, as Dr. Edwards was, was talking about before. Um, we can't always do it physically, but we can do it this way. And it makes us realize that we do have a lot more control over the situation than maybe we think. We don't have total control, just like we don't over anything in our life. But right. there are a lot of things that we can do. There are a lot of people who care. Um, so that's, that's, that's really powerful stuff. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also thank you, um, uh, uh, County Executive, for really trusting um, our organization to do some of this work in the community. I know I, I got a call from uh, Janelle Heinrich. She's the head of uh, Dane County Public Health, Madison Dane County. She's actually going to be our guest next week on our show. And so we want to make sure that we continue to give a, a voice, a, allow them to have that voice um, for this community of, of men that we've um, connected with. And so we're grateful to have her next week. But again, thank you so much for trusting our organization. Obviously with the mass, um, we uh, small funding, we appreciate it. And, and these are the kind of things that we're gonna continue to make available to educate our community. Um, this is, this was something that we brainstormed and all talked about. How can we, particularly when the barbershops close down, how can we continue to support everyone given the fact that the sacredness of the barbershop was gone for a few weeks? And so we've been able to slowly watch them come back. But now that we're you know, broadcasting from the barbershop. I see all the guests and the clientele that come in the door. They give me a thumbs up as they walk in. So they're actually paying attention and listening. So, um, yeah, so any other uh, last words, gentlemen, before we get out of here? 
I think I'll just um, leave it with what Joe opened it up with, uh, which was that our, our enemy is COVID-19 and not each other. I think that was a powerful opening statement, Joe, and it applies perfectly to what we were just talking about when we're in these conversations one-on-one -on -one with people who disagree with us or in groups with people who aren't behaving in a way that's going to be better for them and better for us as a community, reminding them that I'm here to have this conversation with you because um, I care, because I care about you, because I care about the community. COVID-19 is our enemy, not, not each other, not me. Um, and get us back to, like you said, focusing on the common good and the common health of our community and focusing on our common humanity. And I think that's yeah. going to help if we just, like Dr. Thomas said, think this through before you find yourself in those conversations. Excellent. Well, once again, gentlemen, thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, this was our 11th uh, session of our Black Males Mental Health and Wellbeing Support. We're, we're going to continue uh, this. There's been some small interest uh, around the country about having this as a podcast. We will be working on that. Um, but more than anything, we're just pleased to be able to, to share this. Um, I think a lot of what was stated today, we're going to continue to make this uh, available on Facebook and some other uh, social media outlets. Uh, but more than anything, I also want to make sure that I thank our sponsors. We have uh, SSM Health. We have the Wisconsin Partnership Program. Um, and then we also have All of Us um, Research Program and, and obviously uh, Dane County for just, again, trusting and believing in us. Uh, it's really appreciated. So uh, we'll be back next week, next Saturday at one o'clock, God willing. Um, but until then, everybody stay well, stay healthy. Um, and any information, uh, kind of executive that you would like to share with the community, just know that just give us a call or a text or email. We'll have you on. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys. All right.